As states move to criminalize abortion, we're going to look now at growing calls to protect online privacy. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. As fears grow that authorities could use online data to prosecute people who violate statewide abortion bans, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has warned, quote, those seeking, offering or facilitating abortion access must now assume that any data they provide online or offline could be sought by law enforcement. This comes as Reveal, from the Center for Investigative Reporting, has exposed how Facebook is collecting ultra-sensitive personal data about abortion seekers and enabling anti-abortion organizations to use that data as a tool to target and influence people online. We're going to go first to Grace Oldham. Grace Oldham is um, a Howard uh, Fellow for Reveal, um, where her recent investigation is headlined, Facebook and anti-abortion clinics are collecting highly sensitive info on would-be patients. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Grace. So, lay this out for us. Talk about everything from period trackers, you know, menstrual period trackers, uh, to what people say and look for online and how it can be used against them. Yes, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so, yeah, as laws are changing now across the country, there are increased warnings about the risks of how people's data online could be used against them if abortion is criminalized in their state. Um, and so in our investigation, we were specifically looking at crisis pregnancy centers. We've been investigating crisis pregnancy centers at Reveal for months now. Um, and they're quasi-health clinics that are run by anti-abortion organizations with the main goal to deter or delay people from getting an abortion. And because they're not licensed medical facilities, the data they collect on people they interact with, either online or in person, isn't protected in the same way other health data might be. Um, and so, you know, we were curious what's happening to that data and how might it be used, again, you know, as laws are changing across the country. Um, so we started looking at what type of ad tracking technology these, these websites, these organizations use on their websites and found that hundreds of crisis pregnancy websites across the country um, use an ad tracking technology that shares information with Facebook. Um, and, you know, as you said, it's ultra sensitive data. Um, in many cases, it's, you know, includes information as specific as whether the person is considering an abortion, um, their pregnancy status, if they were scheduling an abortion consultation, and even in some cases, names, emails, and phone numbers. Um, of course, you know, this poses a particular risk uh, if an abortion abortion is criminalized or outlawed in states. Um, and it gives, you know, key indications about whether a person is considering an abortion. Um, and amassing that on a platform like Facebook uh, creates particular avenues for law enforcement to potentially use that information. Um, and so, yes, this is one among many potential risks created by data um, that that is amassed online. But, but, Grace, these crisis pregnancy centers, if they're collecting basically a person's individual uh, medical information, even if they're not licensed, aren't they, aren't they covered by, uh, by HIPAA laws in terms of being able to uh, divulge uh, to others uh, uh, personal data on individuals? Yeah, so actually these these most crisis pregnancy pregnancy centers are not covered by HIPAA and that's because they're not licensed medical facilities and they do not charge for their services. Um, so because they're not covered by HIPAA that that data is is not protected um, in the same way that, you know, it might be if it was through a hospital or something like that. Um, and so, you know, that was one of our main questions in starting this reporting is okay, if they're collecting really sensitive data about people, you know, online in forms asking questions like, when was the date of um, the person's last menstrual period or in person? 
um, you know, ultrasound photos, the results of pregnancy tests. Um, and so, you know, we had started really researching what happens to that data once it's collected by these centers. These, uh, and, go ahead, Juan. Oh, and, but wouldn't it be possible to at least uh, require them to disclose to the people that are giving information that they are not licensed and that the information they're giving is not uh, can be shared with others? Isn't there a disclosure requirement at least, or shouldn't there be one? Yes, uh, in, in some cases, the crisis pregnancy centers do mark on their websites when they are not licensed, but often that's tucked away into deep into a privacy policy where, you know, a person not doing like an extensive dive into the website would find it. Um, and th there was also a Supreme Court case several years ago um, that would have that overturned uh, a requirement in California for um, crisis pregnancy pregnancy centers to state whether they are medical facilities. And so, um, you know, they're positioned uh, now more than ever to, you know, make that not have that be as clear as, uh, you know, some consumer protection. And Grace, um, it's reported around the country that they'll often locate themselves next to, for example, a Planned Parenthood clinic and look like that clinic. So people get confused and not exactly clear where they're walking in. But I wanted to ask you about Meta, right, the new name for Facebook. Um, what measures are they taking for protecting privacy? Did they speak to you? Right. So, you know, Meta has policies against collecting sensitive data, specifically including um, sexual and reproductive health data. Um, and in the past several years, there's been reporting and a state investigation which found that, you know, their advertising systems is essentially, you know, quite porous about uh, around the vast information that's um, collected by Meta every day on websites across the country. Um, and so, you know, we found that in, in the case of these crisis pregnancy centers, hundreds of them are, are sharing this information with Facebook, and Facebook is ingesting that data. Um, in response to a New York State Department of Financial Services investigation, Facebook created uh, filtering mechanisms with uh, several thousand key terms, I think it's something like 70,000 key terms um, that are supposed to block um, anything that would be considered sensitive data. Although, you know, in URLs that we found with, uh, you know, pregnancy or abortion in them, data was still collected from those sites. Um, so we sent a list of questions to Facebook specifically questions around their policies around data collected from crisis pregnancy centers um, and whether that data would be shared with law enforcement. Um, and we did not get a response uh, um, to those questions. And we have not seen change since the publish of our story in terms of if the data of the, the sites that we identified has been um, purged. We are also joined by Daly Barnett, a staff technologist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, who just published a set of digital privacy guidelines and guides for abortion providers and abortion seekers on how to protect their information. Daly, thanks so much for joining us. Um, why don't you walk us through some of these key measures that you think are key for people to protect their information and where you you think we're all more vulnerable? Sure. Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, I would say that the first step that uh, abortion seekers, providers, uh, abortion access activists uh, ought to do is an exercise that we call threat modeling. Uh, essentially, threat modeling just means uh, identifying for themselves what pieces of information or data could potentially be used against them and who might want to exploit that data. Uh, asking themselves these types of questions helps to identify the areas of concern they might have, and then from there, the types of measures that can be taken to protect themselves. Uh, from there, I think it's important to employ a combination of non-technical and technical tactics, starting with the non-technical, because those are usually a bit easier. Uh, I think people can set some data sharing standards with their communities. Uh, 
Uh, this means essentially making some rules about what types of information can and cannot be shared with the group or outside the group, et cetera. Uh, basically, it's just pushing a culture of consent when it comes to sharing any kinds of identifying information about, um, about reproductive health or activism or affiliation with uh, you know, other groups. Uh, people can also employ what we call uh, linguistic steganography, which is just some fancy phrasing for essentially hiding uh, true meaning in plain sight or in inconspicuous language. Uh, if it's done very consciously and carefully, it can be really effective in protecting uh, oneself and one's community. Uh, but then from there, the more technical measures people can take are, um, first, I would say download an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging app like Signal, turn on disappearing messages, super important. Uh, also, just generally, I think it's important that people compartmentalize the data around the more sensitive operations like reproductive health or activism away from the more casual ones. So this can be done by using a separate browser with um, hardened privacy, we call it. Uh, so like a browser like Tor or Brave that are built with privacy and security in mind. And using that especially for anything related to their reproductive health or their activism. Um, I also highly recommend turning off location services on apps that don't need it or restricting them when you're going to or from locations where that's, you know, a concern. Uh, turning off the ad identifier on their phones so that the apps can't track their behavior from app to app to app. And um, there's a bunch of other things people can do, but I would just recommend going to look at EFF.org for the guides that we have written. And the daily, what are some of the responsibilities of uh, the uh, the technology companies in regard to this? Of course, clearly, not just Facebook, but for instance, uh, it, with Google, the searches that people conduct on a daily basis and that Google stores, uh, has has there been have there been any laws about a, a particularly? Health-related or or personal uh, health-related matters uh, searches that can be somehow or other protected in, in a stronger way from uh, from uh, tracking than normal searches. Uh, sure. Well, you know, I'm not uh, a policy expert, but I am a technologist, so I'm happy to comment on what these technologies can do to protect the end users. Um, I mean, the reality is that these platforms are the most popular or the largest platforms that exist, right? Like the big ones. Um, and they need to come to terms with the fact that they're holding on to the largest and most potentially uh, dangerous sets of data that can be used against people here. Uh, so these platforms need to make their policies transparent to end users now, especially uh, their policies or in regards to how they respond to law enforcement and how they're responding to subpoena requests. Um, they could also stop behavioral tracking on their platforms because that behavioral tracking amounts to data that could be exploited and used against users. Uh, just generally, they need to honor the privacy of every end user by default. It should not be something that users have to advocate for themselves. They can allow pseudonymous access to their services. Uh, just more like just generally speaking, if the data isn't being collected on end users there, it can't be exploited. If you could talk more in lay terms about behavioral tracking. Of course. Uh, so behavioral tracking, these are mechanisms that platforms will put in place to uniquely identify users on their services and then track the behavior uh, of like what they're doing on these platforms, right? So this can look like um, how long uh, they've been on the site, what they're doing there, the types of services or queries they're making um, on the platforms. And then that data can be collected. And because it's uh, tied to a unique fingerprint to a user, it can then be associated with other behavioral tracking on different platforms. So for instance, uh, Google is the most prevalent uh, tracker in the game, where they have uh, trackers implanted on 75% of the top 1 million websites today. And in terms of what people can do, and we also want to put this question to Grace Oldham, tell us about the My Body, My Data Act. <laughs> 
Uh, sure. So the My Body, My Data Act is a uh, bill that has been proposed to protect people's data around their reproductive health. Uh, it protects the end users. So it restricts the type of data that can be collected by the services that have anything to do with this field, right? But it also allows users, users to meaningfully appeal to have their data uh, deleted at their request. And Grace Oldham, if you can talk about um, your work in um, how people are organizing around the country um, and how people can protect themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, in, in the terms of our investigation, um, you know, Facebook, you mentioned Google has prevalent ad trackers. Facebook is also a big player in the game. Um, and so, you know, we found that Facebook received nearly 60,000 government requests for data um, from July to December 2021. And so, you know, creating public pressure and legislation for Facebook to answer, you know, how data from crisis pregnancy centers would be used, for example, um, is one way. Um, many of the privacy experts that we talked to said that this would be a public pressure or policy issue because um, Facebook's uh, revenue comes from advertising. So there's little incentive to, to fix this on, on their own. Although strengthening the current um, filters and, and um, that they have in place, as well as you know evaluating potential risk of this data being collected, um, would be important as well. And I'm, I'm wondering, Daly, uh, what legislation should we be focusing on, uh, and should the public be focusing on in terms of digital privacy laws? I think any privacy legislation that is a broad privacy protection for all end users, uh, it shouldn't necessarily always be focused on specific areas of concern uh, that are you know, timely. Uh, privacy should just be a default for people. Uh, it shouldn't be something that the end users have to fight for because you know, especially when the data is uh, potentially dangerous that could be used as criminal evidence. Um, the reality is that if these companies aren't collecting this personally identifiable data that can be exploited, the problem is solved in all of these cases. Privacy should not be an opt-in model or something that users have to advocate for for themselves. It should just be on by default. I wanted to ask Grace Oldham about some other research you had done. You were just recently in Dallas and Texas talking to a Unitarian church that was involved with helping people access abortion. Can you talk about uh, what they're doing and what's happened now that a row has been overturned and the history of their work? Yes, absolutely. So I went to Dallas, um, which is where, I fr where I'm from and went to the First Unitarian Church of Dallas, which is actually the church that my family grew up in as well, and had the opportunity to see um, some of the action happening at that church um, around helping people access abortion in New Mexico. So there's a long history there. In the 60s, the Unitarian Universalist Church um, stated their public uh, support for access to abortion. This is before Roe v. Wade. And the ministers at that church were working with the Clergy Consultation Service, which was a network of um, mostly Protestant ministers and Jewish rabbis across the country um, who helped people find um, safe abortions. And so they were working with a doctor named Dr. Curtis Boyd, who we talked about in um, this radio story that we published this weekend, um, who was performing safe abortions before they were legal in Texas. Um, and eventually, Dr. Boyd moved from Texas to New Mexico, and the ministers at the church at the time helped coordinate flights um, from Dallas to New Mexico for people to access abortion pre row well, now, since SB8 in Texas in September, um, again, the ministers of the First Unitarian Church and a network of volunteers um, with the New Mexico Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice, as well as Dr. Boyd, who still owns clinics in Dallas and New Mexico and Albuquerque, are making trips every few weeks 
um, to Albuquerque to bring a group of around 20 patients um, to access safe and legal abortions in Albuquerque. Um, and so the church will continue to support people who are needing access to abortion, um, despite how the laws change and are currently working to figure out like w what the parameters around that will be. Um, but yep, there are flights, uh, Every two weeks, bring 20 patients, um, organized by a network of, of volunteers. The funding and the um, logistics are taken care of by the New Mexico Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice. And Grace, uh, I wanted to ask you about a, a, something we discussed earlier, these crisis pregnancy centers. Uh, and you said that, uh, they are, that there are hundreds of them around the country. Who funds them? Because uh, even if they're volunteers largely that work in them, obviously the rents have to be paid, the organization, the network has to be sustained. Uh, did your research delve at all into uh, how these uh, centers came to be established? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, a lot of the funding is from private funders. There's large um, anti-abortion organization networks of crisis pregnancy centers such as uh, Heartbeat International, for example. Um, in some cases, the funding comes from uh, taxpayer dollars, public funding um, from states who fund um, alternative to abortion programs. Um, and then in some cases, the funding comes from funding diverted from um, federal funding as well. So. Uh, I, the majority is from private donors, but there is some public funding and taxpayer dollars going toward crisis pregnancy centers as well.